looks like the room is pretty full. So, um, so welcome once again to the Jeff and Stephen show. <laughs> it's uh, about channels. Surprise, surprise. Um, how many people have used channels? All right. Okay. How many people have gotta, heard of channels? We've got to find new customers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. We need more early adopters, it's clear. <laughs> of the folks who have used them, have any run into any spurious issues? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. You're special. Yeah. <laughs> this, folks, this folks is one of my favorite customers. He reports all the cars, and he has found many, many things during beta and saved you all a world of hurt. So. <laughs> Thanks. We appreciate that. <laughs> okay, so um, I think what I'll do is um, review what a channel is for the folks who might not have used them or seen them. Um, and uh, these are a couple slides from the presentation uh, two years ago. So um, basically, if you're communicating between two parallel loops, you know how to do it, you set up a queue and you can have one side read, one side write, or you can use a local variable and you can send data from one uh, loop to the other. So there's a flow of data that's happening, but it's not particularly obvious. And so um, two years ago, we introduced the channel wire. And uh, it consists of uh, a write endpoint, a read endpoint, and a channel, a wire between them that shows the flow of data from one loop to the other loop. Now the channel wire is distinguished from a regular wire by a few subtle points. There's a little flange at the intersection with a sub-VI icon, and the um, there's no tunnel that's visible there. Um, so it's kind of subtle, but it's easy to recognize with a little bit of use. It looks like a water pipe, as opposed to the others that look like an electrical wire. Don't cross them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, there's uh, multiple kinds of uh, channels. A stream channel, which is like a queue, and a tag channel, which is like um, local or global variable. Scope to just the things that are connected. So, how do you create a channel? Pop up on a terminal and uh, select Create Channel Writer. And you'll get to a dialog box, and it drops a right endpoint for the channel. In the dialog box, you'll see a selection of channels that you can pick. The top three, stream, tag, and messenger, are the most popular. Um, and then there's some more, and actually more since this uh, dialog of two years ago. Um, on the right side is, a for each uh, channel, there's a uh, a selection of variations for the endpoints. And the variations are basically just uh, fewer or less parameters that you have available to uh, select, uh, to wire to on those terminals. And at the bottom, there's a really nifty animation that gives you a hint about what the channel is doing. Um, really superb animations. It's almost, <laughs> almost like graphics are useful for depicting things. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, so, um, oops. Channel reader endpoint. If you pop up on the terminal for a channel, there's a channel output for that uh, node, you can say create channel reader, and you get a similar dialog. This time it's showing the read endpoints, and you select it and drop the read endpoint. Um, if you want to change the endpoint, to one of the other options, you can pop up and say replace endpoint. Uh, it doesn't make too much sense in this case to change the channel type because you can't connect a tag, tag channel to a uh, stream channel and vice versa. Okay, so here's uh, an example that I showed, uh, and I'll spend a minute on this to uh, show you uh, just how things are working. Uh, this is a VI that um, is a multi-stage, multi-rate FIR filter that's doing uh, resampling of an analog signal uh, to a different uh, sample rate. So here's the diagram. There are four sub-VIs, four instances of a re-entrant sub-VI, plus two loops 
that are all running in parallel. There's the loop on the left is writing into a stream channel, and that's feeding into the input of one of the instances of the sub-VI. And there's another stream channel coming out the output of that sub-VI call, feeding to the next uh, instance of the call. And finally, it gets to the end, and uh, the loop on the right is reading from the last channel and displaying the data. If you're having trouble thinking about this, think of this as a pipeline. And if you've written FPGA code, they're all running simultaneously. You hit the go button, there's no data dependencies. They all go at once, and then the data is produced as each one is cascading down. And so it's each token moving through the system. So if you look at the front panel of that um, sub VI, you'll see that it has um, input channel and output channel connected to the connector pane. So that's how. Uh, a channel wire gets into a sub-VI. Inside the sub-VI, <clears throat> uh, you know, a little bit of preparation stuff going on, but the main stuff is uh, in the loop on the right, and you can see that um, each iteration of the while loop will generate an output to the output channel and read zero or more uh, values from the input channel. And because it's reading zero or more, uh, that's how we get a rate change, basically. Um, so the point is that um, we're showing a diagram up here that, as Stephen said, it's like a pipeline. We've got streams connecting VIs, sub-VIs, that are continuously running in parallel with the <coughs> beginning loop and the ending loop. Questions on this? Have you seen this before? Does it make sense? The significance of the this, yeah, stream in and stream out, whether or not they're inside the loop, is there a flip for the matter? Um, yes, because what you really want to do, um, you want to be putting values into a stream endpoint repeatedly, um, while in another loop you're pulling them out uh, at its rate, and so it's a producer-consumer kind of setup where you want the producer and the consumer running in parallel, and you're going to dump data into one end of this pipe and read it out of the other end of the pipe. I think your, your question, though, was why can't we just put the FP terminals inside the loop? Yeah, right. That's, um, that's mostly because people were confused when we beta tested it. If they put it in, they felt like somehow they were reading the value of the channel and by putting it outside and saying, no, it's, it's like, as if it's coming in from the outside world, we got many more lower level users to, to grasp the concept early. So we said, we, we pin those, we require those to be at the top level diagram. And so it's flowing into your application, out of your application. But would it cause an error if you put it inside the wild loop? Um, we, yes. we do actually break it. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't have to, but it's um, semantically confusing enough that uh, we decided that it's best to keep it at the top level, and so we'll enforce that. All right. Other questions? Yes? It's also trying to get around the, like, with the first case, it's like the entrance separate. Mm -hmm. It's operating on data coming in the screen on the left. The output data has changed, and that's what's being operated by the second case. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So uh, in the lower diagram, you can see I'm reading from the uh, stream coming in on the left, and then I'm computing with that piece of data and producing an output value on the output stream. Correct, yes. Um, so, what's like controlling the loop execution timing? Is it like a queue or a wave or anything? It's, it's exactly like a queue. The writer will block until the space in the queue to write. And the reader will block until there's a value ready to read. So it's governed by the flow in the, in the stream itself. Furthermore, the way this thing stops is that lower input on the um, writer, on the stream writer, uh, the Boolean input, is a flag that says this is the last element. When you set that true, better exit the loop that's writing to that because you're telling the channel this is the last value I'm going to write. 
all the other loops will detect that signal. Uh, and when they see that signal come with the last element, it will stop that loop. So that's the way everything orderly uh, has an orderly shutdown. For those who were in the last session, this is embedding the stop signal in the protocol of transmission. <laughs> is it always read right at one? Stream channel is um, a point to point. There's only one reader, one writer. Uh, there are variations of the endpoint that allow you to read multiple values or write multiple values. Uh, but fundamentally, it's, it's uh, uh, a single um, value that's going into the queue. The tag in the messenger allowed for the, for the channel to fork to do broadcasts and to do something together. But you could put an array. I mean, you can, you can put into the screen and the rec. Yes. But so it's whatever. Any data type will work. So you can put uh, clusters, you can put arrays, you can put classes, uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, yes. Each each piece of well. Each segment of wire in their channel is a separate channel. So the, the inter VIs, they're obviously waiting for the data to arrive to process. Yes. But they're, they're look, look, let's actually stress things. that. They're waiting here. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff isn't waiting on it. So that this part can run in parallel in all four of them at the same time. It's only, it's only when they get to the read of the channel that they have to actually block. So all of this is preparation, just setting up the coefficients of the filter in a uh, computationally efficient way for use inside of the loop. It's, it's not that the whole sub-VI is waiting for the first value. And it's always blocking in that instance. Right. The, the channel layer further down has data that one can be operating in. Correct. In harm. Exactly. So they go as fast as that computation. That's right. And as fast as I can produce the data and as fast as the computation can go, that's how fast the data goes. Right. Yeah. So this uh, example is in the channels examples uh, folder. There's a, a bunch of them. <coughs> So this pipeline could be done about a language and stuff because the data problem is what would you be used for the system. Correct. Yeah. And you could have done this with a queue. You would have had to create a queue over here and another one there and another one there and another one there and another one there. And then you do a N queue and a D queue. So it's it's doing the same things that we could do already in my view. It's just doing it in a more obvious way where the data is actually flowing. And it's taking care of a lot of the ancillary uh, infrastructure by automatically creating the queue behind the scenes. And, and, it, and it's actually, let's, let's be not quite so forgiving. It's because it's not just that it's nice for you that you can graphically depict it. Our system knows more about what you're doing with that queue data. And we can do a little bit of optimization and awareness of, you know, you're not having to clean up that queue reference because we know when you're done with it, that sort of thing. So there, and, and so we may not even be using a queue. I'm not going to tell you what's under the hood of that <laughs> Furthermore, uh, this last element, it, it's kind of like a sideband channel, a sideband communication along with the channel. And we iterated a lot and um, got all of the timing and race conditions out of that and made sure that um, we constructed it properly. Uh, but if you wanted to do the same kind of thing, um, you have to invent all of that again and debug it again. And many of you have. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, see, in your last comment, it was a little surprising to me because I was going to say, I noticed it's not yellow, so it doesn't get some primitive. It's not. So we can dive in and see the queue communication? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Channels are written in G. And if you're familiar with the um, lab, so called Lab U2 style globals or functional globals, that's what's behind the scene. And so, yes, those are sub-VIs, and you can drill all the way down to the bottom level implementation. Yeah. 
in theory, you could write your own channel. If you truly needed a brand new protocol that we haven't provided, you can clone them off and, and generate your own. It's tricky. We didn't make that a first class citizen of LabVIEW. We haven't provided really the tools to go after that because there's a lot of polling or hunger in our place. But um, it, it, you can do it, and eventually we would like to see that the sort of thing that rarely, when you need a new protocol, you might be able to roll your own. Question? Yeah. What if you're winning uh, using channel water compared to using all these words in one or a group? We worked on it until we had a very efficient implementation. So um, the question was, is you know, what 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 are we losing performance-wise? Um, we think it's a it's, we think it's a good trade-off. Um, to do something like that with multi-rate would be very difficult to put into one program, <coughs> and uh, so I, I think the multi-rate example is a good one to show the benefits of having parallel. Uh, producer-consumer loops and a channel connection. Okay, so here's just um, uh, an overview of the basic channels, streaming, tag, and messenger, and uh, some of the options you have on the endpoints. So on the read and write endpoints, you can specify timeout, um, and uh, you'll get a flag back to timed out. In fact, uh, the default is uh, block until data is available or space is available is appropriate. Um, there's the last element flag that we talked about. Uh, there's also an element valid flag. So that's essentially like having a case structure around the, uh, right, so that uh, it makes it a little bit more convenient in some situations if you're uh, trying to decide whether you really want to uh, write something or not. <clears throat> uh, there's also a place to specify the size. By default, the stream will just grow uh, as necessary, unbounded, but you can specify a fixed size if you want. The, the stream is your fundamental producer-consumer. So right. where you guys are writing fixed producer-consumer loops and they're statically related, you can create a queue and wire it down, or you can just run a channel. A lot faster, a lot less clicks. The uh, Tag um, actually can have multiple readers and multiple writers connected, um, and uh, the, the endpoints are pretty simple. Um, pretty much speak for themselves. Uh, the messenger is a very interesting one. Um, that's like a stream and a tag kind of combined, in that you can have multiple writers and multiple readers of a messenger channel, and it fundamentally behaves like a queue. But it's all based on the class. The element is a class, and you can inherit from that, and uh, you get some uh, special methods associated with that that uh, are interesting to you. But I won't go into that here. Okay, so um, we're all familiar with the queued message handler, and uh, this is a simplified version of what we ship in our uh, queued message handler design patterns. Basically, there's two loops, producer-consumer loop. The uh, top loop is an event loop that accuse messages. The bottom loop is the consumer loop, and it uh, takes actions based on those messages. And you see the way uh, it's uh, <coughs> implemented in the, uh, with a typical uh, queue. And um, the top loop, when, it, when the uh, exit the stop button is in on the top loop, it sends the exit message. And the exit message will uh, close the queue and uh, exit the bottom loop. So that's the way things stop. So I went ahead and made a version based on channels. Call it the channel message handler. It's also uh, located in the same directory of examples that I mentioned before. So it's the same kind of thing. Uh, I'm using a messenger channel. It's got an event uh, loop sending messages to a consumer that's responding to the messages. And when I see the um, uh, exit message, I'll um, send a last element to my status display. So I did one thing a little bit differently here. Instead of having a UI element in the message handling loop, 
I moved all the UI stuff over to the left here, so I have a separate room for displaying stats. And so that's just a stream of uh, strings that uh, get displayed, and when uh, when I see the exit, uh, I'll send the last element to here, and it stops that loop too. So I want to know something that'll really play with your head when you're looking at Levy code. You can get the two UI loops, select them, and do create sub UI. And you have a sub UI that has an output and feeds back into itself, because that's exactly what's happening here. And it's showing exactly from the UI to the processing and back again. Um, and we can draw cycles with, the, with these wires. Yeah, that's an important thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, cycles are uh, necessary, are uh, a big advantage of having channels, the ability to have cycles like that. The asynchronous flow of data means that you're not tied to a synchronous flow where this has to happen, then this, then this. The asynchronicity allows us to pass data back to the beginning and start, start the whole flow over again. Okay, so here's a slight variation on that. If you wanted the status to be updated immediately, in the case when uh, doing the operation takes an extended period of time, a few seconds, say, you'd like to know during that few seconds what's actually going on, so you might want to update the status right away. So you wouldn't want to take the output of the case structure in there and use that as the last element flag that would delay writing to the uh, stream. So um, we'll have a, a separate test for exit uh, in order to feed that. But that allows us to do the uh, write to that channel immediately, even though the uh, case is going to take a few seconds to actually finish its operation. So um, we can get a little bit uh, more responsive views uh, about what's going on. Uh, here's a, another variation that uh, is doing the same thing, but now I've got a case structure around there, and I put a timeout on the um, on the reader, messenger reader, and um, if we're not getting any messages, I have the option for doing something, uh, say some background task periodically if uh, I don't have messages to process. And in this case, I might say, uh, if I get a timeout, well, let me go ahead and clear the status display. So the status display will show what's going on, when it's going on, and then I'll get cleared when nothing else is going on. So minor tweaks. Um, okay, so something else that we show in our example of the queue message handler is um, the um, event, hand, I mean, the Handling message handling loop actually enqueuing another message. And this, um, I, I don't particularly consider this a, a good design practice, but uh, we show how to do it and, and you can use it in, in some situations. But it actually introduces a race condition. And um, that may or may not be uh, an issue, but. Um, you can see it clearer in this example. So here, you can do the same thing with the channels. Uh, you can have a, a, some activity, some action, enqueue something else into the um, message queue. But it becomes pretty obvious that it's doing that because you see an actual wire coming back and fanning in. We, we should be very clear. It can introduce a race. Yes. There are plenty of patterns that do exactly this. In fact, we have state machines that feed to themselves all the time. But you ever read the JKI state machine documentation? There's a whole section in there on being careful about making sure these are atomic and not trying to feed sets of things because they might get something inserted between them. And we, we had problems with that. With, that's why we created the batch message for the actor uh, framework. And that's why EQMH has, has some of its safety valves. It's a can cause a race condition, and now you can see that it can. And, and, and in this particular case, you might be enqueuing something while another event has occurred. And so uh, it's a race because you don't know whether your enqueuing is going to get ahead or behind the next user action. When you say atomic, is that referring to an 
No, it means will this operation be done as a coherent whole with no other operations from other sources inserted into the middle of it? So in particular, if you had that function enqueue several uh, additional mm -hmm. messages under the assumption that they're going to be sequential in the message queue, that may not be the case if a user action uh, was inserted in between. But the point is that with a more explicit representation of the channels, you can actually see that, oh, I'm doing something here, and because this is fanning in, I need to think about uh, the effects of, uh, you know, who's going to win that race, or is it a problem from here or not? Jeff? Is there a priority on these messages on the stream? No, it's not a priority queue, but it could be. And so, as Stephen was talking about, uh, you know, if you're adventuresome and wanted to try to make a variation of the messenger that had priority, um, that would certainly be uh, something that you could tackle. <laughs> so, just just to clarify, when you were saying that you can enqueue multiple, uh, and, and they're not necessarily going to be operating in that sequence, they're going to be operating in that order, but you exactly. cannot guarantee that nothing is going to get inserted in between. Right, and right. what this uh, semantics does that the Q doesn't do is that, like uh, Jeff is saying, it makes it very clear that that's the case. Where you learn that that's the case when you get burned by it. <laughs> As we all have at some point when yes. we think we're being clever. Yes, Okay, so uh, the actual example is in the polar X. has a few more interesting things in there. Uh, for showing how to abort an operation, and I'll, I'll have a simpler example further on about that. And um, and then there's a, a neat feature with the messenger channel that allows for active, uh, acknowledging messages. But uh, mm -hmm. yes, the messenger channel has an uh, acknowledgement back channel. So. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a simple Okay, so um, the next thing I did. Uh, one more back here, Jeff. Oh, sorry. Jeff to Jeff. If I do actually decide to use that poor pattern where I'm, where I'm <coughs> channeling to self, is the exit flag attached to the message, or is it separate from the message such that the exit will happen at the exit? Okay, so first of all, the last element flag or the exit uh, flag is available on the stream channels, not on the messenger channel. Okay. The messenger channel being class-based, you could have a class signaling the last uh, element. In it. But there's a lot more, I mean, it's a little bit trickier because if you've got multiple writers, um, how, do, how does the, uh, uh, the consumer or the server know that uh, it gets uh, a last element flag from one of them, but uh, it's got to know that it's got it from all of them in order to be able to actually shut down the server? And, and that's a, a challenge. So um, Research is in progress on that. <laughs> OK, thank you. Right. <laughs> but in the meantime, you want to shut down a messenger, you have to code it. <laughs> okay, so um, I uh, built another example called measure and log. Uh, it's also uh, patterned after a measure and log kind of uh, cute message handler example. And I made my channel version of it. Um, I also made a storyboard that uh, tries to uh, hint at how you might evolve um, the design uh, from a high level of abstraction, sort of like a talking like uh, keynote. Uh, so uh, you can click through that too, and that's interesting to see. But the idea is, um, my top level application, I've got a UI, I've got some kind of DAC uh, acquisition going on, and then I might be logging the data as well. And if I refine that another step, I can say, okay, my UI is going to be sending command to the DAC module, and that's going to be uh, sending back waveforms for the display and uh, a status uh, about the condition of the acquisition going on, and then it can send a, a file path and waveform data to the logger if I'm logging the data. Um, 
the next thing I might want to do is actually design the front panel and show the buttons that I've got. And I find it very helpful to design the behavior of my user interface using a state diagram. And you can draw this out by hand, you can use a tool to do that. Um, but I, I find it very helpful to see um, what the behavior of my user interface ought to be. And uh, as somebody was saying in one of the UI uh, sessions, that <clears throat> your users are going to create a mental model uh, of how your UI is working uh, in their heads. And so um, if you do it with a state diagram, they'll discover it pretty quickly. If, if it's more ad hoc, it's going to be hard for them to figure out how things work. So in this case, uh, when I start running, I'm in the idle state. And it's, uh, the start button is hit. I start acquiring data and displaying it on my graph. Uh, and if I hit the stop button, I stop acquiring data. And so I can turn the DAC on and off with start and stop buttons. <coughs> if I hit the exit button, I'm going to exit. Or if I get an error, I'm going to exit. Uh, if I'm in the idle state, I can hit the settings button, go into a mobile dialog, and change the settings for the data acquisition, and then when I complete that, I can go back and run. The re uh, logging of the data is actually a very simple uh, additional state diagram that says um, whenever I'm in the run state, if the record button is on, I'm logging. If the record button is off, I'm not logging. Uh, then I can go ahead and define my UI loops. I have my status loop uh, as in a single channel message handler example. I've got a uh, data display loop, similar style. And then I've got my event loop to the sending messages. <clears throat> and I use the uh, um, enabled status of the controls in order to enforce the behavior of the state diagram. You, you just can't hit the start button again you're already started. And once again, that exit button will shut down that loop, which will shut down the acquisition loop, the logging loop, and the acquisition loop will stop the two display. Yeah, so there is uh, two sample projects uh, on the getting it started in LabVIEW that implement the continuous measurement and logging. There's a continuous measurement and logging that uses the MIQMH, and then there's a measurement and logging that uses the state machine. Is this one closer to the one that does the state machine or to the, the one that uses the MIQMH? I believe we based it off of the one that is the, is the, the QMH. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was, the, that was the one we started with on, on this one. The one that had multiple loops. Right. right. Yeah. All right, just checking. And to be clear, this is a shipping example that you can you can pull apart in your own time. So it's all doing simulated I/O. Yeah. Okay. So um, then the next step would be uh, designing the DAC loop, and this is a simplified version of what's up up there. I get messages, and I can start the data acquisition, um, and I can stop. I can exit. Uh, if I get a settings command, I can update the settings for that. Uh, and uh, normally, when I'm if I'm acquiring uh, and logging while I'm acquiring, then I'm going to read data from the DAC and send it to the logger. The logging. Okay. Um, then we then, implement the actual logging. Yeah. And so in in. Uh, Something I've used here is that if I um, send an empty array to the logging loop, that means stop logging, and the next time you're going to open up another file to log to. And so when another waveform comes over, I can say, um, if I'm supposed to open up a new file, go ahead and create the new file and then write to it. Otherwise, it's just not already. Okay. Is there a semantical reason why you put that loop going to the left versus the logging loop? So, um, why these come around this yeah, way? Versus. So this is going back to the UI display. This is the status display. This is the data display on the screen. So we were kind of keeping all the UI elements. 
there's a, there's a bit of discussion when you start looking at the layout of things with channels of how do you want to choose to organize things and we've been talking about ways of doing diagram cleanup and you might organize them as related functionality, sequence of data flow, uh, maximum parallelization. There's a few different ways of doing it. Um, this was, we organized this by functionality as we found it was approachable trying to block it off when we started writing documentation for it. So normally I like to think of it still as left to right data flow, mm -hmm. but because there are, uh, I want to group the UI elements over here, um, then I want the UI, uh, the event loop sending messages this way, and I want status coming back. I mean, I could have put the status displays way over here, I would have been fine and preserved the left to right, uh, but it uh, means that I have UI elements here and over here, and if I we're trying to modularize this and uh, put it in a sub BI or, or whatever, uh, I want those together. I've done quite a, a, a lot of channels, and, and what I found worked for me was particularly when I'm using familiar channel messaging. That's big. If there's an event structure feeding it, I put it up above it because that's what I'm using yep. big event structure. If it's going to feed parallel pipelines, I put it below it. And they're usually a <laughs> single DIY. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and I I didn't mind showing the loops coming around the top and going back between the two. That's the way it flows. And we've been kind of developing style guide based on as as code comes into us and where we do customer visits. Um, we've been trying to come up with some style guides around these. Um, the passing things vertically has all, has been quite popular, as in use your top and bottom terminals more for the channels and your left to right for yes. the data flow. Yes. I've been seeing an awful lot of people standardizing around that, and so we may re revisit this at some point. But that, that's where we stand at the moment. Yeah, that's the other thing. Are you going to add support for broadcast or multiple consumers? Uh, broadcast and multiple consumers. So the uh, messenger channel allows for that, oh, as okay. does the tag. Oh. The, the stream is point to point. The messenger and tag are, are, are broadcast or multi multicast. Are the channel wires still all within the I think you should ask that. <laughs> That's a Why don't we keep research going? topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an active research topic. Okay, so um, here's the uh, full application. And um, the, the thing I like about this is that it's pretty easy to see where the actors are, if you will, and the channels that connect them. And uh, I've got UI elements over here connected by channels to the DAC task, connected to the logging task, and the DAC task is connected to my simulated uh, DAC board and, and device under test. How many of you have taken the Certified Lobby Developer exam? Good number. So I, I get to occasionally see those exams um, and just to kind of keep my finger on how are people, what, what style are they using and this sort of thing. And two in particular came up in the last year. Two people did their entire CLD using channels. And what was fascinating to me was it was immediately obvious that one of them had passed and one of them had failed. <laughs> <laughs> and it was totally because you could visualize one of them had the five basic modules that were needed for this particular solution were completely interconnected. Every possible connection between them had been filled in with a channel. It was a mess of things. And the other one had a couple of feedback loops between the main processes and a fan out to the sub to the sub pieces. You could see physically the modularization, and it took almost no grading to say this one has done a module breakdown and has actually met the, the requirements for I, the isolation of, of, of the systems. And it's very much what you see here. You can see who's talking to who. And of course, you could put all of these in sub VIs achieve something that looks like that high-level, simple abstraction of your whole application. And you know, how, how easily would it be then to switch out with your DAC or your SIM modules here using the channel wires to get real data as opposed to simulated data, you know, from a testing and development perspective? 
So um, I haven't tried to do that yet. I think it's possible, uh, but the, um, the the DAC architecture is uh, doesn't quite fit the same uh, architecture we have here. They they do things with uh, you know initialization, configuration, uh, go into loop, doing something, and then shut down. And uh, I'm going to have all of that basically in a state machine that's communicating with channels by, by using channels. And, and so I think it could be done. I haven't tried to do that yet. Not I've, on this example. I haven't tried one. to do it with DAC, but with some of the uh, more streaming sensor type of stuff, um, there's games you can play with uh, call by reference nodes and just with even with just case structures around it to choose which sub VI to execute. The channels still require a static connection, but the thing that they're statically connected to can be runtime decided. So uh, you can choose, you know, execute frame A or frame B. They can flow into um, the, uh, you know, the call by reference node. So you can get that kind of flexibility, and I've used that to, to do simulation versus real. Uh, Stephen, I think that, I might have misunderstood, but I have a similar question. So if you have two flavors, Forget about the hardware simulated, whatever. If you have two flavors of the same VI, mm -hmm. the DAC, and you want to swap it, can you do that? With some of the other tricks that you would use in LabVIEW to swap things out. So, Dynamic so, dispatch, so, call by reference, case structure. Yeah, but like for example, if we if if were just queues, you just need the queue reference and you connect the, to the connector pane and you, you're done. Right, what channels express is how many things are you going to have speaking? It doesn't necessarily require that you know at, at compile time what's going to be speaking. So in that sense, you can choose. But we, we don't express dynamic, not really, uh, full dynamic uh, range of stuff. Uh, there's a little bit of dynamism you can get with the parallel for loop in the messenger channel. But for the most, and, but even there, you're declaring a fixed broadcast set. And that's what channels are really about, is to, to express your static communication between your modules. And in the long run, getting a syntax that we can fold even the more dynamic parts under that rubric. But you're saying you wrap that in a class state dynamic dispatch at runtime, you can invoke a different Correct. version of flavor of it that still connects to that one channel. Right. Still your single channel connection. That's right. And, and you can do that uh, also with the case structure. For example, in one case, I'm calling this sub VI, in the other case, I'm calling the other one. Each of them are connected to that channel. Okay, so um, we can talk about a few other design considerations when you're um, using channels. Um, the main benefit of the channels is they make the communication visible. And uh, so uh, in the producer-consumer case, you can see the data is flowing from uh, the producer to the consumer, event handler. Processing mode. Um, another thing to think about is uh, how do things shut down? And so in this case, um, the um, exit uh, button is going to cause the event handling loop to stop and it's going to send the exit message to the processing loop. The processing loop is going to see it, uh, that message, and it's going to stop. So we're stopping the event loop and then the processing loop. In the uh, channel message handler <coughs> version, same kind of deal. We're sending messages from the uh, event handling loop to the processing loop, and the event handling loop will stop and send the exit message to the processing loop. But in this case, the processing loop is also sending data to the status loop, and it will shut down the status loop with the last element. Um, you can see uh, with the channel wires some of the um, issues that can be um, can arise. If, for instance, I try to put my status inside the same loop as the event handling loop. Now I'm going to stall my event loop, waiting for uh, a status message before I process the next event. And so that's not necessarily so good. However, there's a new channel that 
uh, allows you to connect up to the event handling loop. In this case, all of the status signals will be coming back as events, and you can pull out the data and also pull out the last element. So what happens in this case is that I'm sending data from the event handling loop to the processing loop, and, and when I send the exit message, the event handling loop doesn't exit when it sends the exit message. Instead, it's waiting for the data and the last element to come from the processing loop. So now in this case, it's actually the processing loop that stops first and then the event handling loop. So um, you, you get to think about, I mean, all these problems exist with whatever other mechanism you use, cues and bolts and stuff. You still have to worry about this. But I think it makes it a little bit more visible here when you can uh, look at uh, how the data is flowing and then who's prompting who to stop in what order. If you remember, a lot of you I, were faces in my last presentation. We taught, I said, everything, the whole game is about recognizing the data flow and being able to analyze that, the resulting pattern. This is helping the human level of that analysis. It's also doing a little bit as we go forward to help the compiler level of lab use analysis. That's a good point because also under research is how we can use the extra information we have now in the compiler to help analyze the diagram and point out things that might be problematic for you. Every refnum we eliminate is one step closer to nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the measure and log example again. I'm just going to skip through this, but uh, basically you have the same kind of issue about where data is flowing and in the simulation of sending uh, uh, commands down basically and getting data back, uh, but it's the acquisition loop that's responsible for stopping the uh, simulation loop. Um, it sends uh, data to the logging loop and it normally will shut down the logging loop, but there's a, also the ability for the logging loop to stop the acquisition loop because of an error, say, file write error. And, um, but in either case, the uh, acquisition loop is what stops the other two loops. And in this version that I've done here, I wasn't using the event channel, so I need another way. If a file error caused the DAC loop to stop, which stops the, the simulation loop and stops the display loops, I still have to stop the event loop, so I need to create an extra event, or I could merge that display loop using the event view back to the original. Uh, oops, okay, sorry, quick point. Um, so let's talk about some potential mistakes. Um, on the left-hand side, if you've got a channel wire connecting two loops and a regular wire connecting them, that's typically an error. There's very few cases where that might make sense. Uh, in this case, uh, when, when you're connecting nodes with a regular lagging wire, it means do the second node after the first one completes. When you connect it with a channel wire, it typically means do these at the same time. So that's you know, a conflict semantically. And uh, so we ought to have the compiler flag these as at least warnings, if not errors. In this particular case, uh, that's a pattern we use for testing. <laughs> but uh, so it, there are rare situations where it could actually be useful. Most of the time, it's going to be an error. No, really. You say that's not an error? It, it doesn't have to. I mean, sorry. We don't break the BI. Okay. I didn't mean it's not there. It's not a stupid thing to do. It is <laughs> your, it's <laughs> one case where I am trying to forward load the buffer and guarantee that the queue is as, the channel is as full as possible, and then allow the the, the uh, consumer to start eating. So okay. we can do load testing. Okay. That is the <laughs> only case I know of. Yeah. Very very rare circumstances. Right. Doesn't make sense. Uh, Okay, here's uh, another situation. Because you can have cycles, and cycles are particularly useful uh, with channel wires, you have to be careful that you don't have a deadlock situation. This is a deadlock. Both loops are going to be waiting to read a piece of data before they write a piece of data. And so you're stuck. So you can do this with queues. You can do this in lots of different ways. Um, what you want to do 
wire on the first stop. Or you have a... And, and, and take, take the stop off the second one. It's not the stop that's causing the problem. It's just starting the two loops. They both start and they both try to do a read. Nothing's in either pot, in either stream, so they're gonna oh, oh, right. they're gonna block. So, so you've got a deadlock. The easy way to fix this one is a first call that sets a timeout on the first one. Either a timeout on the first one, or you have a case structure that says on the first iteration, write a value before you read it. So. Uh, uh, it make, I think it's a little bit easier to analyze when you see the connections this way than if you create some cues and, and you have writers and readers around. It's a lot harder to um, analyze or see what's happening. <clears throat> um, here's another situation. I've got two producers and one consumer, and my consumer is going to force the synchronization of the producers. Or, uh, you know, if one producer is running a lot faster and I don't have a bound up on them, it's going to be growing and growing and growing because uh, a slower one is going to throttle the uh, operation. So it's not wrong, but be careful when you do that. Uh, and, and of course, if you put a bounded uh, size for the buffer in each of those cases, you won't get into trouble, but it may not do exactly what you were expecting. Or it might. Or it might. You're trying to do something <laughs> that might be. Yeah. That's why, that's why we don't make all of these necessarily break the BIs, is there are cases for all of these. That's why they're potential mistakes, not actual. Right. right. So here's another case. Um, <clears throat> if I've got two streams connecting two loops, and one stream is producing a value each iteration, and the top one is producing a value only half the time. The uh, valid signal at the top is true only half the time, so that's only writing a value into that pipe half as many times as the bottom is. Well, the uh, buffer in the bottom one is just going to keep going indefinitely. Again, it's not wrong, but it's uh, probably not what you intended. I actually have a, a somewhat theory that if you ever have two streams, the unforkable ones, and they're connecting the same two while loops, that you probably have a bug of some sort, and I don't know what it is, but so far all of them I have found some issue that you probably didn't want. So if you ever get it with two streams, think about making it a cluster of a single stream. Because so far I've found every test case that we've had, there's something that, yeah, that's actually not what you meant. That's a good point. Not yet. Not yet. We didn't. We haven't gotten a VI analyzer. But this is still. So this. We've only had this out for three years so far. And when we first passed, we were trying to allow the community to develop these things, and then we could recognize because maybe something would come up that was actually a good, perfectly good usage for that. And we didn't want to rule things out a priori. So we're getting to the point now where we can start asking, you know, Darren and the other G programmers, please add this to the VI analyzer test. <clears throat> so um, as I uh, we mentioned before. The messenger channel <clears throat> can have multiple readers and multiple writers, and but it's important to note that uh, in the multiple uh, writer case, um, there's actually a non-deterministic merge. Um, it just depends on the rate of the, the two loops. There's, there's no particular priority or ordering that whoever writes first gets in first. Can you get first yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So same, uh, just like normal queuing behavior. And uh, same thing when I've got two uh, consumers and one producer, the data will get distributed on the terminus. And just so everyone is clear, that's everybody is dequeuing one by one. It's not copying the data. There's there's another node you use if you want to actually do a copy to both sides. So. Yeah, but each one will read one, and then he'll read A, then he'll read B, then he'll read C, then he'll read D. Um, yeah, they, they're they don't pulling it out of a single queue. Yeah. Oh, right. So um, they've, each one of them is getting a non-deterministic <coughs> subset, but they're um, the same. Okay, so um, here's an example of what you might want to do if you're trying to wait for data on either of two channels. So uh, if a new piece of data comes in 
on the top channel, but not the bottom, I may want to do a computation and write a new value on my output stream. And similarly, if a value comes in on the bottom and not on the top, or if a value comes in on both of them. Uh, there's not really a way to do this any better than having a timeout. You can use a, uh, a non-zero timeout or a zero timeout and put a, uh, something to throttle the loop behavior, a timer in there. Uh, but that's pretty much what you have to do if you're trying to wait on either of two things. So but maybe with we're the event. A little behind. Yeah. Do we want to slip ahead to anything in particular? Uh, um, We've got about seven minutes left. Okay. I've got a whole bunch of stuff. We're not going to get to it and didn't expect to. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I covered the stuff that, uh, in the beginning as well as I could. Um, so maybe uh, I'll go a couple more minutes and sure. then we can just open up for questions. We can just lock the door and now that <laughs> <laughs> uh, All the slides are up there so you can uh, read ahead and see uh, some of the other interesting stuff that's there. Yeah, we asked for two hours and they were like, no, no yeah, people no won't be able to sit in their chairs that long. You can put that in your feedback. What? <laughs> so here's another bigger chairs. I made and uh, it chairs. kind of uh, blew our minds because we had this notion that, well, if you have multiple channels connecting the same two loops, it's probably an error. And uh, we had to back off from that and say, well, if it's two stream channels connecting, it's probably an error. Because here's a use case where I've got a stream channel and a tag channel. And what I'm doing with the tag channel is basically um, augmenting the behavior of the stream channel. I want it to be able to say, when I hit the pause button, stop generating data and have the consumer flush out all the data that's in there and wait. And then when I release the pause button, let everything continue again. So I was able to do that using a tag channel that has the suspend flag, basically, and my regular stream channel. And so this might be a good way to experiment with additional kinds of sideband communication that you'd like to have, or additional protocol that you'd like to have built into a channel. And then eventually we could uh, say, uh, you know, if this is popular enough, whatever, let's build a, a richer channel that has that the capability built into it. This, this particular one is a little cheesy, and there's possibly some better ways you might code this particular example. But that side, the idea of passing sideband information as tag and meta, you know, meta information about the ongoing state of it, we've found a few other places where that's been useful. So I was going to ask a question before you show this. Um, and you mentioned the log example. What if a logger gets behind and it gets the last element or the stop message? Was there a way to flush the channel before you shut everything down. That's a good point. So the last element flag is not um, set immediately. It's associated with the last element in the queue. Okay. And so the reader will keep reading data until it gets down to the actual last element, and then they'll see that flag. Separately, we have the abort signal, which will actually, which you can put on the writer, which will clear it and set that last element immediately. The tag, tag channel can be anything? The tag the channel can be, all of the channels can be anything. Any lively data type. Don't try to stick an actual bowling ball through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the signal coming off the bottom? Is that how many elements are left? Yes, yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Right. Oh. So that's another output of the stream channel. Uh, read and write will tell you how many elements are in there at the time that you did that read or the write. So, so what I'm doing there is I'm basically saying, uh, as soon as, when I'm in the um, suspended state, I'll do a read with uh, a zero timeout, so it return immediately, sure. and it tells me how many elements are in the, uh, in the queue, right. and I'm gonna iterate there to try and flush as many of those out as I can. And, and, and the counting at the bottom is just just guard in case you're suspended or something that stops. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you got to stop. Right? Yes. Right. We're trying to figure that out. Okay. Yeah. Didn't want to dwell too much on it. <laughs> uh, All right. That was the basics. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another feature that's available in um, all 
of the channels. It says abort, and abort is a sideband communication that actually goes both ways. The uh, producer can cause an abort, and the consumer can cause an abort and have the producer abort. So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. All right. So, a normal stop, you use uh, last element, and then the consumer will keep reading until it gets to the last element, and then uh, we'll stop. The producer can abort. He can say, um, I want you to stop right away. And so, the next read that the uh, consumer reads, he'll see the abort message, even though there's still data in the uh, in the stream. And the consumer can just go ahead and work. The stuff left in the stream doesn't matter because it's getting closed at the end of the execution and it'll get uh, reinitialized on the next run. Um, the consumer can abort. It can decide that uh, for some reason or other it wants to abort. It's going to send the abort signal on the read and that will appear on the uh, producer side and uh, if the producer was waiting because the queue was full, it'll wake up and they'll see the board message and know to exit. And then finally, the uh, uh, consumer can read some data and do some computation and then decide that things are bad and wants to abort. And so it can set a flag that's used in the next iteration to cause the abort. So this um, abort signal we're still a little ambivalent about uh, how valuable it is and uh, whether, you know, it seems to work well if you've got, uh, you know, one, uh, one or two channels that are, um, you know, pipelined. Uh, more than that or more complex architecture and it may not actually help that much. Yeah, at some point we, we know we need to strengthen how a board happens when we start stringing multiple channels together and we haven't, we haven't found a nice syntax for that yet. So. If anybody stumbles on, you know, you know, sketching things on paper, and you're like, hey, if I was to draw it this way, the abort signal could propagate backwards really nicely, we'd like to see it. Um, we've had, we've played around with it, but it's, it's not as nice as we'd like it to be. So, you know, something like we showed just previously with the suspend signal, that might be an angle to experiment with a couple different layouts for that, and it might give us uh, some clues how to put that into the channel concept. Anyway, um, I think I'll stop there. Like I said, there's a lot more slides with a lot more interesting stuff, but we'll save that for next time. Sorry? Right? Right? Yes, you have, data has to be written into the channel and then it can be read. There doesn't have to be an ordering between those as far as they can be in anywhere because the channel doesn't enforce an order of the execution. But there isn't any data available until the right executes wherever it is. Uh, so you can set a, a can you set flags the on the reader yeah. that say just go on past if there's no data available. That isn't an option. Could you, repeat? Peter, could you repeat the question? Sorry, he was asking whether you can have a writer or a reader go on past even though there's not data available. And yes, there is a, you can set a, a timeout of zero uh, that says, you know, if there's not immediate data, then just go ahead and return. <coughs> Stuff like that. So you don't have to be slave necessarily. Uh, sorry, um, my question is that uh, in the consumer loop, you have written a report now. And in the producer loop, you have to write the data. Right yes, you, have, you actually yes. have to execute that uh, ah. right uh, endpoint in order to be able to see the output of it that says abort. So, uh, but, you know, if you wanted your producer to be live, but not always writing data, you could say, uh, have the top input, which is uh, whether the data is valid or not, be what toggles it. So you could sit there and write at a um, particular rate and just when the data is valid, 
say is uh, for the true and tough part. And then you'll always be live enough to see the abort signal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was uh, reading I hope so. <laughs> um, we have certainly fixed a number of bugs with exactly that. Uh, and Can not with you repeat the question again? There were problems with moving channels from one computer to another uh, with the re them regenerating correctly. I believe those have been resolved. If they haven't, please let us know, but that has certainly improved. Um, I hesitate to say ever say that something is completely fixed until I hear from the field, and uh, I haven't actually gotten full confirmation on that one. But I think it's fixed. Thank you. So, and just a quick overview of how this works. A right-click pop-up menu is what gets invoked when you uh, pop up on your terminal and say, create channel writer. And then uh, that uh, pop-up uh, item scripts the copying of a template uh, representing the implementation of the channel to the lab data folder and uh, specializes it to the data type that you uh, popped up on. And so uh, it's using scripting to create uh, an instance of that template for that data type. And uh, so um, there are, I mean, there are potential issues with scripting if something goes wrong. That all of the VIs that are scripted um, are source only. So their compiled code is cached in our object uh, database. And so um, there's a lot of uh, moving parts here that um, we've been trying to track down all of the issues to make sure that uh, these get regenerated when we move from one machine to another or another version of LabVIEW. Um, and if you build an application, the appropriate channels are copied into the application and so on. Uh, but I, I, I believe their, their result was Levy 2017 SP1. So uh, we've had a, we, we, uh, they're, they're pretty, pretty solid at this point. Let's do one more question and we'll, we'll have to call it. How do you envision this channel out there? Um, where do you see it fitting in? So we've rewritten the actor framework to replace all of the in communication with channels. We've, we had some experiments with that. We've taken apart a couple of other uh, frameworks that you may have heard of and played with their internals and showed them as simply modules connected with static channel connections. Um, there is a real value to this. At the same time, a lot of those frameworks handle the true full dynamic case where you don't know how many you're spinning up or what kind. So we're still, we, we clearly see that there's a place to advance the state of the art there, but I don't know that we are quite at the stage of saying we have a better idea than the existing frameworks in all of, in the cases that those frameworks serve. You might mention the one thing you cannot do with the channel, you can take them across the structure. Oh, uh, you can take them across, uh, well, you can't go directly across the structure right, right. Uh, and, and without doing something inside. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that, that, that also means that if you bring it into the sub VI, you can't you just bring it out. Because right. right. that, that's not meaningful. Exactly. No. And uh, the explanation gets a little bit more complicated, but uh, that's correct. <laughs> All right. There's a lot more. If you go on ni.com slash channel wires, uh, there's a, that's the shortcut link to the forums. You can discuss stuff. Jeff and I monitor that, as do a number of other people in R&D. And uh, we'll see your questions online. So thank you. <laughs>